And uh, good morning, everybody. I missed you yesterday. And sorry for that, because of my health problem. Uh, mm? I mean, for the moment, yeah. <coughs> I have short memory. Uh, the topic I have is uh, titled Political Shihad, Constitutionalization of Sharia as a Case Studies. A case study. And uh, I want to start with that the, the problem of dealing with this issue at the beginning, because I think much of the discussion on the Sharia and Constitution is today about the stats of Sharia in the Constitution. What should be the stats of Sharia in the Constitution? Which means basically a uh, few articles of constitutions need to talk about Sharia and specifically as about Sharia as a source of law. And I think that is not the issue, actually. The issue is not about the status of Sharia in the Constitution. It's about the status of the Constitution in Sharia itself. How the Constitution from the beginning to the end is compatible with Islamic teaching. It's not just about legal or two or three legal articles talking about Sharia as a source of law. <clears throat> so focusing on the stats of Sharia in the Constitution as we have it today is a part of very minimalistic uh, or minimalist view of Sharia that need to be revised uh, and we need to look at Sharia in a different light, I think. And this is led us to going back to the sources. Sharia in Quranic terminology. The word Sharia in this sense, or the word Sharia, uh, is used in Quran only one time. And that is the verse 18 of Surah Al-Jadhiyah. ثم جعلناك على شريعة من الأمر فاتبعها. Yes, there are other uses of the uh, term terms related to Sharia, like Sharia, like the verb Sharia, but the word Sharia was used only one time in the Holy Quran, and that was in this verse of Surah Al-Jadhiyah. ثم جعلناك على شريعة من الأمر فاتبعها. The translation according to Sheikh Abdullah Yusuf Ali, then we put the on the right way of religion. So follow thou that way and follow not the desires of those who know not. So Sharia in this verse is not law, it's much more than law. That's why Sheikh Abdullah translated it, and I think it was accurate translation way of religion. And actually there is a proof from the earliest interpretations of Quran that we have. For example in Tabari, who is called the father of Tafsir. In Tafsir Tabari is a Sharia to a din. Sharia is religion. He didn't say Sharia is the legal aspect of religion or the ethical aspect or the social aspect. No, Sharia is the whole religion, which means all the components of Islam as a religion, faith, morality, uh, social norms, identity, and the brotherhood between believers and laws, all of that is a part of Sharia, and of course, Sha'air or Ibadat. So what we need to do before we discuss today any, any debate about Sharia and the place of Sharia in this state, I think, need to start with redefinition of Sharia and going back to the Quranic use of Sharia, not the technical, legal, narrow definition that is commonly used today. Even if we look in the Islamic intellectual history, we'll find that there are some scholars who use Sharia in this broad sense, or at least in a broader <laughs> sense than, than what we have today. For example, 
an Ajuri who died 360 Hijra, which is about 960 or 950 uh, in the Gregorian era. <coughs> he wrote a book called Kitabu Sharia, <coughs> the book of Sharia. But this book has nothing to do with Islamic law or the legal aspect of Islam. The book of Sharia of al Ajuri is a book of politics and theology. It's talking about Khulafa Rashidin and how great, how great they were and their policies and talk about some theological issues related to Qadar to other things. But nothing about Ahkam, nothing about the legal aspect in that book. You see an example of how the term used to be used in early Islam in a different way than what we have today. Another example is Al-Raghib al-Asfahani, uh, who died 400 Hijra. And his book, Al-Dhari'a ila Makarim al-Shari'a, is a book of ethics. And of course, he's not saying that Sharia is only ethics. In the, in the introduction of the book, he himself said that he wrote a book about Ahkam al-Shari'a. And now he's writing a book about Makarim al-Shari'a, which means at least he still recognized that Sharia has moral aspect and the legal aspect. He already has a book, had a book on legal aspect, and he said, because I wrote a book on the legal aspect of Sharia, today I want to write another one on the moral or ethical aspect of Sharia, which is this one, al dhariya ila makarim al-Shari'a. Again, we still have at least a broader sense of Sharia than what we have today. So this is Sharia in the Quranic terminology. Based on this uh, terminology, based on this broad sense of Sharia that we have in the Holy Quran and we have in early Islam, now we need to ask the question which part of Sharia is disused or mu'attal? Which, which part of Sharia is not applied today in Muslim society. Some people will tell you, oh, Sharia is, all Sharia is, has no place in Muslim societies today, in Muslim countries today. That's not true. No, it's not really. If we take Sharia in the broad sense that we already, we have talked about now, Muslims are still firm in their beliefs, most of Muslims. Most of Muslims are observing their ibadat, their worship. There are probably people who pray in mosques today more than 100 years ago or 200 years ago. There are probably people today who are, who are observing Ramadan and fasting Ramadan more than people used to have probably 100 years ago. So it's not true that the Sharia is just frozen in, in Muslim societies or Muslim countries. Many social norms, Islamic social norms, are still observed today. Many general manners and ethics are still. Some laws, some Islamic laws are still applied even within the secular post-colonial national states that we have today. So why people are complaining, or many people are complaining that, well, we need to apply Sharia, Sharia is not applied because of this minimalist view of Sharia again. So if you want to solve a problem, we need to have the right explanation of the problem first. Much of Sharia in the broad sense is still applied, still in practice today. So what is missing? What are the disused components of Sharia? <coughs> most, the most important in my personal view at least, are the constitutional principles of Sharia. What I call previously in the, in the, uh, in the last, my last lecture, the uh, core political values. Those core political values or constitutional principles are disused. And by Muslims themselves, not by the European colonial, <coughs> Muslims are the ones who stop applying the Islamic 
constitutional principles a long time ago. In the mid of the first century of Islam. Because of many circumstances that, that can be explained on a historical uh, ground, but that is Muslims' work, not Western or colonization. <clears throat> and there are some aspects of Islamic law, especially penal law, and commercial law, that are disused in Muslim countries today and replaced by European legislations. And part of it is because of lack of jihad, and much of fiqh become just, unfortunately, it was not up to date to deal with many challenges of Muslim society. It's not only also because of it, the European law is imposed by colonizers, it's because also of practical reason that, unfortunately, Muslim scholars didn't do their homework enough to provide answers. And, and therefore, the void has to be filled with any kind of legislation available, including the legislation that was inherited from the colonizers. So constitutional principles are more important than any detailed legislation. Sorry. Constitutional principles deal with the acquisition and distribution of political power and the relationship between rulers and rule. And this is the big challenge in Muslim societies today. Actually, this is the big challenge in Muslim, in Islamic civilization from the, from the start. When uh, Shah Rastani, the great historian of Muslim sects and groups, noticed at the beginning of his book, Al-Milal wa nihal that the issue of political legitimacy is the, was the biggest challenge. And Muslims never fought with each other over any issue more than over this problem of political legitimacy. وَأَوَّلُ خِلَافٍ فِي الْأُمَّةِ خِلَافُ الْإِمَامَةِ وَمَا سُلَّ سَيْفٌ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ عَلَى قَاعِدَةٍ دِينِيَةٍ مثل ما سل على الإمامة في كل زمان. So Muslims never use sword against each other and kill each other over any dispute more than over this dispute of political legitimacy and who has the right to rule. So constitutional principles of Sharia are what we need today to solve this chronic problem of acquisition and distribution of political power and the relationship between rulers and rules. Unfortunately, because of the defensive mode that Muslims have today, dealing with Western culture, they are more attached to these details that has been frozen by colonizers, more than about the chronic major problem that we have in our own history, which is the problem of political legitimacy. So before establishing Sharia as constitutional principles, there is no need for debate about detailed laws. There is no need to debate about laws if you don't have constitution. That is just putting the, the cart before the, the horse, as they said. So that's unfortunately what's happening today when people say, oh, we, not, we want tatbiq sharia, we want application of sharia, and they take, talk about it in legal, detailed legal meaning, not on the constitutional principles of sharia, which are much, much more important. And also they should have been precondition of any kind of legal application of sharia. Again, all of this is because of this minimalist definition of Sharia. And I think uh, was, I enjoy what Dr. Tariq said yesterday morning about this, you know, the risk of reducing Sharia in the legal aspect. Yes, Sharia is not only the legal aspect. But the legal aspect also is a part of Sharia. I don't want also to go too far with some people who want to minimize the legal aspect until they end with making Islam just a moral system or a moral philosophy. 
Now, Islam is not only a moral philosophy. There is a legal aspect of Islam. But there is much needed jihad to, to do that. <clears throat> One of the major issues that we need in constitutionalizing Sharia ah today is distinction between morality and legality. The majority of Islamic teaching, and this is also mentioned by Dr. Tarqis today, the majority of Islamic teaching falls within the space of morality, not the space of legality. And moral aspect of Sharia ah must be left for the individual conscience and to the social pressure, at least, but not to the coercive, heavy hand of the state. Sultat al Damir, said in Arab, Sultat al Damir, not Walaysa Sultat al Dawla. That's why in Islam there is a big difference between sin and crime. Every crime is a sin, but not every sin is a crime in the legal sense. So people can make sin, but without, without defining this as a legal crime. No, this is between them and Allah Azza wa Jalla, if he wants to forgive them or punish them, it's a day of judgment. Actually, according to Imam al-Haythami, the major sins in Islam or Kibair are 70. But how many of them Islam provide a, a, a penalty in this life? Very few. So this is an example of the difference between moral and the legal system. Unfortunately, some people who, are, who want application of Sharia ah are not able to separate between what is moral and what is legal. The state has no right to enforce morality, except in a very limited uh, way. Much of morality has to be left to people. For example, the state has no right to impose on people to pray or to fast, or to go to Hajj. If the state tries that, that means just creating hypocrisy and using oppressive means. If a uh, mutawwa come to me, or these religious police in some Muslim countries, and come, oh, close your store and go and pray. So there is a problem here, because am I praying for Allah or praying because I'm scared of this? guy. So here th there is a, a, real, a real risk of hypocrisy. And that's really Allah Azza wa Jalla wants us to worship freely out of conviction, not out of fear of the, of the state. So excessive legislation of morality creates hypocrisy and deepens deepen oppression within <laughs> society. And that's unfortunately what happened in some instances of so-called application of Sharia, like example of Taliban or in Saudi Arabia or in some other countries when the state and, and dictators like to do that because it's a part of the con compensation for political legitimacy. A dictator wants to, to show that he is the defender of the faith and the defender of the morality. So, this is just a part of mechanism of compensation for lack of political legitimacy. Like dictators who give money for free for people distributing the wealth, public wealth, uh, uh, unjustly in order to, to buy people instead of. But that's just part of what we, we call in Arabic ta'wil an sharia siyasi, or compensation for political legitimacy. And it's not new, this is a very old techniques. Uh, a Yemeni historian wrote many centuries ago, uh, Al-Hamadani, in his book, Le Iklir, he said that Asasul Mulki Al-Daha'u wal That the authorities should be based on two things. Al-Daha, cleverness, and al is giving. Just take and give without any kind of accountability. So in Islam, actually, there are three layers of responsibility. Dr. Muhammad Abdullah Draz explained this beautifully in his, uh, in his extraordinary book, The uh, uh, 
the morality of Quran or in, in the English translation, the moral word of Quran, in the French original, La morale du Quran. The story of the fil Quran in the Arabic uh, translation is he's, he talk about three layers of responsibilities. Damir al Vard, wa Sultan al Mujtama, wa Ikrah al Dawla. Damir al Vard. The first, the first one is the conscience of the individual, and that actually is what religion focuses on, especially Islam, is try to make people do the or uh, take care of their responsibilities out of personal conviction without pressure from the society and without coercion from the state. Inna ladina yakhshawna rabbahum bil ghayb lahum maafiratun wa ajrun Okay, that's the first. The second is the pressure of the society and that is a part of Islamic morality. Not coercion, but it's some sort of moral pressure. There are some people who don't fear Allah Azza wa Jal, but they fear, you know, scandal. For example, they they are concerned about their personal reputation, even if they don't care about God's punishment, but they care about their personal reputation. So that kind of social pressure is also a layer of of this kind of of, of the Islamic moral system. And then the last and the least is the coercion of the state, is when you have to use the state to enforce. <coughs> to guarantee the sincerity of religion and the freedom of people, this order is very important. It has to be respected. Anything that can be achieved by the individual should not be done by the society. Anything that can be done by society should not be done by the state. <coughs> And this is very important in constitutions, because what we call today uh, civil societies and all of these kind of intermediary organization between the individual and the state are very important because they are, they are uh, doing this, this social function or this social, uh, uh, this social pressure and social function that cannot be done by the individual and should not be given to the state at the same time. But to constitutionalize Sharia, there is a need of more practical, I can say more pragmatic even, definition of Islamic law. We have to have more practical and more pragmatic definition of Islamic law. I talked two, day, two days ago about <coughs> about Islam presenting itself as a completion, not as a religion that will destroy the previous faith or a culture that will destroy the previous culture, and emphasizing the commonalities with others. I think that is a very important aspect of Islam that many Muslims are missing today because, again, of this defensive mode that we have. So we are almost falling in the trap of what uh, Professor uh, Tim Winter is calling the poverty of fanaticism uh, because we are too much obsessed with our identity. We, want, we reject very easily anything that is not ours. And this is not a good sign of uh, health in any culture, by the way. Uh, Allah Azza wa told us about some people of the book who said, I mean, they have no objection on Quran per se or Islam per se, but their problem is that these messages were, this message was not sent to them. If they are told belief on what has been sent by Allah, what has been revealed by Allah, they said, we will believe in what has been sent to us. It's about us. And that is the problem. So Muslims need to be careful about this us here versus them. We need to focus on the essence, moral essence of the idea, regardless of where this idea is coming from. We need more flexibility and openness. The leaders of Quraysh, some of them refused Islam, also on the same ground, that it's about me. It's not a, they have no objection on the principle itself, 
They said, no, they were Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad didn't really deserve this great message. Should, this message should have been sent to one of, of the leaders of our, of our respected tribal leaders. This Quran should have been sent to one of the great men of the two cities. They mean Mecca or Taif. So they have no problem. If the Quran was sent to Abu Sufyan, okay, they will accept it. The problem is not about the principle, the problem is about the person. So we need to be careful of that, I think. Uh, so we need to be more practical, more open, and we need more humility dealing with what we need uh, and what we share with others. This leads to this idea of more practical and more pragmatic definition of Islamic law. I don't think an Islamic law has to be derived directly from the Islamic sacred text. No, any law that serves the community and does not contradict Islamic scripture should be seen as an Islamic law. And if we, if we start from this, we'll solve 90% of the clash that we have today between what they call Qanun al-Shar'i wa al-Qanun al-Wadai or the Islamic, Islamic law and positive or positivist law. Laws can change also in time and place and continue to be Islamic law. Different countries can have different laws without transgressing the limits of Islamic teaching. Muslim countries can reflect their own distinction, their own culture and identity without violating Islamic law. An Arab country can put in its constitution that the official language is, is Arabic and another country can put that the official language is Turkish or Persian or any other language and they can talk about some ethnic and cultural identities in their constitution differently without violating the Islamic law. There is much flexibility. So uh, any law, as I said, that serves the community and does not contradict the sacred text should be seen as an Islamic law and the, an Islamic constitution should have room for this kind of law. Uh, one of uh, my shuyukh, Sheikh Muhammad Salim, rahmatullah alayhi, used to be a great scholar and judge. And uh, I always remember uh, uh, something he said about this. Uh, there is a deba debate in the 80s about application of Sharia. About that. And he said, ما نحتاج إليه اليوم ليس تقنين الفقه بل تفقيه القانون. He said there are two ways to, for application of Sharia if you want in the legal sense. If you want to have to establish Islamic legal system in Muslim countries, they say there are two ways. One option is we go back to all of these long, you know, 1400 years of Islamic legal tradition and all of the madahab and try to build from zero. Article 1 and Article 2, and probably we'll, we'll need hundreds of thousands of articles in order to build. Or another way, he said, more practical and more compatible with the social reality today is no, we don't need to do that. We just need to revise the existing laws, regardless of their sources, whether French laws in Algeria or Mauritania or English laws in Gulf countries or in Pakistan or others. All what we need just to revise these laws and to be sure that they don't contradict Islam. Yeah, we need to create more laws probably, but you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to start from zero. <clears throat> and I think this is actually more compatible again with the spirit of Islam as a reformist and not... Uh, <coughs> sorry. As a reformist religion. One of the historian of religion, well, the American historian of religion has a, an uh, interesting article, uh, if I remember the title was, Islam as, as the first Christian reformation. <laughs> title of the, of, the, of, the, of the article. He said, saying that Islam actually was reformation before Martin Luther and Calvin. Islam brought reformation to Christianity and to Judaism. And actually, that spirit of reformation is 
Islam didn't come to, again, to replace, but to reform. Musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh min al-kitab wa muhayminan alayh. Okay, another aspect of this debate on the constitutional, constitutionalization of Sharia is the multiplicity of sources of law. Can we have multiple sources of law? I believe yes, we can. Again, and I think this is not new even in Islamic history. Not new in Islam since the Charter of Medina, actually. The Charter of Medina included some of the customs of Arabian tribe that existed before Islam, but they were incorporated within the Charter of Medina. If we read the Charter of Medina carefully, for example, in Dr. Hamidullah's trans English translation of, of this in his, in his book, The First Written Constitution in the World, you find that you know, the Charter of Medina is talking about the customs of the Medinan tribes, pre-existing customs before Islam about, about blood money, for example, and other issues. And Prophet like that the Charter is saying they should keep doing what they have, they used to do on this. وَإِنَّ بَنِي عَوْفٍ عَلَى مَعَاقِلِهِمْ وَإِنَّ بَنِي فُلَانٍ عَلَى مَعَاقِلِهِمْ So yeah, they should keep going on what they used to have to solve this issue of blood money, for example, the way, the way it is. So these are customs of pagan tribes of Arabia that have been incorporated within the Charter of Medina. And I think there is a good lesson here that, again, Islam is open to incorporate anything that serves the community and serve the principles of justice and does not contradict the Islamic scripture. Again, when we go back, I mean, down with the history of Islamic jurisprudence, we find the principle of Urf or customary rules that uh, it's a good illustration of this incorporation of local laws within the Islamic principles. Of course, we don't forget that the authority should always and must always be to Allah Azza wa Jalla and to the text. But who said that all of people's culture or customs are against that authority or contradict that authority? They don't actually. <clears throat> so what Islam claim matters is that revelation is given primacy and the authority in case of any contradiction between the sources of law. In any Islamic constitution today, we can open the door for all kinds of sources of law, but we have to explicitly give the primacy to the Islamic scripture. We can borrow from local customs of Muslim people. We can borrow from the laws of other nations, Muslims and non-Muslims, but with the primacy given to the Islamic scripture in case of Contradiction. That's what we need. And this is will make more practical and will also solve much of the perceived contradiction between Islam and other cultures and between Islamic law and other laws. Finally, there is no need for uniformity in, in Islamic constitution or Islamic law. Sherman Jackson has a beautiful article, Sharia Democracy and the Modern Nation State in Fordham Law Journal. And uh, in, in that article, he said, the pre-modern Muslim states offer clear precedent for the establishment of political arrangement, arrangement grounded in the principle of equality of respect that recognizes the right of non-Muslims to follow the dictates of their own religion. In the Islamic tradition, non-Muslim minorities were given the right of some self-rule or and some court, you no know, court, special court for the community to solve their own problems according to their own beliefs and customs. They don't have to go to a Muslim judge as long as they can solve their problem within their own community and according to their own faith. That's fine. You know how is the uh, huge reaction about 
Sharia in, in Canada and all of these, you know, noise today? Well, in a traditional Islamic society, there is no problem for Christians or Jews or others to go to their own local court and solve, do their marriage with their own church. And, there is no, and it's recog uh, recognized by the state. So they don't have to follow the, you don't have to have this kind of uniformity, legal uniformity that the modern nation state is imposing. No, we can have modern Islamic state without this kind of uniformity. There is a room for some diversity in constitutional and legal diversity. So the historical Islamic states recognize the right of a Muslim minority to have regulation for their affairs from within their own belief system, not from Islam. And these, these lead to very controversial and very difficult and painful solutions for some Muslim scholars, by the way. And Jackson mentioned one of them, which is a known case in uh, the book of Ibn al-Qayyim, Ahkam Ahl al-Dhimma. You know, there was, there was, a, there was Zoroastrian minorities in historically in Muslim society. They used, to have, they used to be in Arabia in the time Prophet. Prophet Sallallahu said about them, according to Hadith in Bukhari, Sunnu bihim sunnata ahl al-kitab. I mean, deal with them as you have dealt with people of the book. And then these minority continue. It's continuing existing today, even today in Iran, these Zoroastrian minorities. Okay. In their tradition, they have no problem to marry their sisters, for example, or their mothers, at least in their old tradition. I don't know about today. And this was really a big problem for Muslim jurists. Should Islamic State allow this kind of marriage or not? I mean, it's against the basic principles of Islam. But does the Islamic State have the right to impose on this minority, Zoroastrian minority, for example, to avoid marrying brothers and sisters or marrying, you know, son and mothers and this? Ibn al-Qayyim has a very difficult debate on this. And actually, he's defending the idea that Islamic State has no right to to cancel this kind of marriage, with two conditions, he said. That it, they cannot do it as an Islamic court. They have to, be, to do it on their own. And another condition I don't remember exactly, but he has a very long debate on this in, in his book, Ahkam Ahl al-Dhimma. He said, yes, you cannot prevent them from doing that. Uh, because there is a, an usuli, an usuli uh, rule, or at least there is a rule that many scholars talk about, that al-kuffar ghayru muhatabina bil vuruq that non-Muslims are not really asked to follow the practical aspect of Islam. Before they accept the belief system itself, you cannot ask them to practice the, the I mean, it's absurd to ask someone to pray or to fast while he's, he's not Muslim in the first place. So if you want to if you want him to fast, you need to ask him to accept Islam first. But try to impose on him fasting or prayer and he's not Muslim, it's just absurd. Say, same thing for Ibn al-Qayyim in this. So, uh, a, pre, a modern Islamic state so doesn't, does not have to impose a moral or legal uniformity on diverse community. Contrary to what many think in, uh, in the West and elsewhere that Islamic State means, means oppression of minorities. Now, actually, minorities can have better, in, in an Islamic State based on constitutional Islamic principle, non-Muslim minorities can have more rights than what Muslims have in Western countries today. Because they will have the right for, they have recognition of their legal system or some sort of legal system within that they can solve their own problem within their own culture according to their own belief. And Muslims are not allowed to do that, for example, in some, in some aspect, even in the most liberal Western countries. Uh, OK. Who has the interpretive authority in all of this? If you want to constitutionalize Sharia or legalize 
Sharia I mean make codified Sharia making it law. Who has the final word, the interpretive authority here or Sultat Wiliya? Here I think we need to go back to the text again. All Islamic teachings related to public affairs are addressed to the community, not to the rulers. Addressed to the community. It's responsibility of the community to have the rulers first and to make the rulers follow those teachings. And uh, actually, Juwaini has beautiful expression on the internet. The Muslims are the Muslims. والإمام في التزام أحكام الإسلام كواحد من الأنام ولكنه مستناب في تنفيذ الأحكام المسلمون هم المخاطبون مسلمون as a whole or as a community are the one who are addressed by this teaching related to public affairs the imam or the head of this state is just one of them and he is delegated to to take care of the executive aspect of this. But, but the, the Islamic discourse or the Islamic text is not addressed to the ruler, it's addressed to the community. And then the community will convey the message to the ruler. That is the right order here. So political rulers are more delegates of the society to implement its value system and preferences. <coughs> The community then has the interpretive authority of the, sac the, of the sacred text with the help of its people of knowledge, of course, al dhikr Muslim scholars, as experts, have to help the community, have to educate the community. But what makes this interpretation binding and this one is not, is a decision of the community. So the final word is the community. It's the community that will take, okay, we will take Malik's opinion and make it law in this case. And we will take the Abu Hanifa opinion and make it law in this case. That's the decision of the community, not the decision of the scholar, scholar himself. The scholar himself is just an expert, like an expert to give his opinion. He has a moral authority, but he doesn't have the legal authority to make his opinion binding. And you know that Imam Malik refused to make his book, Al uh, Muwatta, a law of the state, when the Abbasi Caliph asked him or proposed that he can make his book law for the state. Malik said no. <clears throat> Which means that scholars of Sharia as experts are to advise, but they are not to dictate or rule by force. There is no textual basis for Wilayat al-Faqih, actually, in Islamic scripture. That the, the scholar just become head of state because of his scholarship, on the merit of his scholarship, not because of people elected him or selected him. No, that really has no basis in Islamic text, and that's no basis in uh, Islamic tradition. This is a an innovation that started a few centuries ago and then finally taken by Khomeini and transformed into an establishment, an established state. But even within the Shia tradition, it was always a minority opinion and actually started only in the 12th or 13th century as an idea. The idea that a jurist can be the ruler of the state based on his scholarship, not based on choice of people. <clears throat> uh, to constitutionalize Sharia, we have to take into account uh, the context. Context of time, space, feasibility, political conditions, etc. And you cannot constitutionalize Sharia without social and political consensus. And what I mean by consensus here is satisfaction of the majority and the agreement between the main social actors, the main political pairs and social actors. You cannot impose Islamic law on a majority that doesn't want it. No, 
the majority doesn't want Islamic law in this case, your role is to convince them not to coerce, not to enforce, but to convince. That means you need to go a step back and start convincing people. You cannot impose it by force. The Prophet ﷺ did not impose Islamic law on a majority that doesn't want it. He didn't build a state in Mecca. He has a state in Medina. Medina population, majority of the Medina population were Muslims. So he did not do that. Again, it's, a, it's community responsibility. It's not responsibility of the ruler. If the community doesn't want to do that responsibility, you need to remind them of their responsibility. Doesn't mean you need to have a coup d'etat and impose on them what you believe is an Islamic law. Or do what Yeltsin did and send tanks to, to bomb the parliament, for example. No. Hmm? Sorry, not Yeltsin. Who's, who did it? Yeltsin actually was uh, against the... Yeah, anyway, th there was some, you know, uh, attacking of the, on the parliament at the time because of political dispute. No, you cannot do that. Parliament, parliament is representing people. This is, and this is people's responsibility. If they, if they don't want to do the responsibility, you need to remind them of the responsibility. That's it. You cannot enforce it on a community, a law that they don't believe in it. A real law, actually, that is a law that is coming from the heart people or out of their conviction. So that's why the majority will, will be law binding. They will, they will respect the law because of that. Even the place of Islam in the constitutions can vary from country to country based on these applicability rules. For example, transitional moment like time of revolution and post-revolutions require some more consensus actually, require more caution and more prudence in introducing Islamic principles in the constitutional laws. Because you are, ba you are building foundations first. Some Islamists are hasty and they want to jump to conclusion. They want to implement, they want to introduce Islamic laws or Islamic constitution without gaining the trust of people or the majority of people or, or without convincing the main social and political prayer. I think that is wrong. That's, that's not wise. The Prophet ﷺ was not sent only by, with principle but also with wisdom. Wisdom, kitab. Well, hikmah. He was sent with the book and the wisdom, al kitab al hikmah, which means principle and the implementation of the principle. That's why some scholars said that hikmah is a sunnah. I mean, you have the principle, he was sent carrying a principle and a method, a specific methodology of implementation of the principle. And part of that methodology is, is to be wise. And wisdom is. The definition of hikmah in Arabic. Putting everything in the right place. I mean, even your, your political decision need to, be, need, to, need to take into account the, the, uh, that transition moment or that specific circumstances. So the divided society is not like society that is not divided. Uh, time of transition is not like normal time. There are many things that need to be taken into account. So sometimes graduation and delay for the maturity of your social context is very important, legitimate. legitimate. Sometimes even, finally, we can, you can use what they call in diplomacy constructive ambiguity in order to build consensus on the long term. Let's say, for example, there was a long debate about Sharia in the Tunisian constitution in the last few years, and I was following this debate. And Nahda party was talking about, at the beginning, we need explicit text about Sharia as a source of law, or are the source of law, or are the major source of law. There are many options. But there was a very strong secular tendency in Tunisia, which is 
deeply influenced by the French laicity. And the time is time, it's a moment of transition. You just get out of dictatorship. You don't want any kind of shaky situation that might open the door for military rule again or oppressive state. So they accepted some kind of this constructive ambiguity that let's say that Islam is, is the state religion. This is a very open for interpretation. If the social situation is mature for implementation of Islamic law, you can interpret this. That means Islam is the source of law. If it's not, you can also avoid that. So they accepted this kind of ambiguity deliberately to avoid any kind of decisive uh, position that might uh, destroy everything uh, and that might bring people or bring the oppressive state back. Okay, okay no problem. I will, uh, I, I will say a few words on the uh, secularism or separation of state and religion uh, because constitutionalization of Sharia cannot be done unless we have some kind of uh, consensus on this issue of relation between state and religion. I think there are three kinds of, of course, secularism is known, but there are, of course, uh, different types of secularism, especially what, uh, what Olivier Watt talked about, you know, the two types of secularism, what he called the uh, Anglo-Saxon soft secularism and the French hard secularism. And there are different also type of practice, practic, uh, practical secularism like the uh, Ahmed Goro in his beautiful book on the secularism in Turkey, US and France, he gave a very good illustration of the different practice of secularism. You know, you know, for example, Turkey is officially a secular state, but actually it's building mosque every day. It's appointing imams, not only in Turkey, but maybe even in Germany or in other places. They are, so their understanding of secularism is not necessarily the same as in France, definitely is not. In, you, even the US is not the same because you know the, the story of faith, faith-based community that George Boyd talked about in order to allocate some money for, for his social base, which is religious based in the Christian fundamentalism of, of the South in the US, etc. Uh, so I believe there are three kinds of separation between state and religion. Institutional separation that prevent rulers from misusing religion and guarantees freedom of conscience for all, I think this is beneficial for both. For example, neutrality of the mosque in politics. I think that is very legitimate. I don't want the imam of the mosque to be in an uh, in a election campaign saying, uh, guys, go ahead and you have to vote for so and so. That's really, it's, it's problematic. I think there is needs some sort of neutrality of the mosque as an institution. Politically, if the imam want to be candidate, he just need to resign and go and do politics. That's fine. Uh, there is a need for some place for consensus. We can fight each other on TV, but we cannot fight each other inside the mosque. The, the imam should, have, should give moral guidance of, for example, he, he should ask people to elect those who of integrity and uh, those who will respect their religion, etc. But he should not say, vote for this party or for that person. This institutional separation, I think actually is, will serve both the mosque and the state. Especially that dictatorship is abusing and misusing these religious institutions in our countries. We know what's happening in Azhar, we know what's happening in many other institutions when the state using them. And my friend Matez will give you some funny example probably on, on how the state is using the religious institution. Uh, ideological separation that chases religion away from public life is, is impossible in Muslim countries and it's pure coercion. You cannot. You cannot prevent religious people from contributing to politics, from or preventing Islamic parties from competing 
according to the rules, rules of the Constitution. You cannot do that. And if you try to do that, I think that's just coercion. That will be against any kind, any spirit of freedom or democracy. And the legal separation that ignores cent the centrality of Islamic laws for the state also is meaningless. Laws are part of Islam. They have been part from the beginning of Islam. Yes, law is not the most important component of Islam. It's not everything in Islam. Actually, most of the ruling of Islam are moral more than legal. But still, the legal aspect of Islam is there, and it has to be a part of any Islamic <coughs> democracy. So what I believe in is a creative synthesis that might be seen by Islamists as Islamic and by secularists as a secular. I think that is possible, actually. There is possibility of historic compromise. Why? Because of the practicality of Islam. For example, if you find that 90% of the existing French laws in your country are not contradictory to Islam, and you keep them. So are these laws Islamic or secular? I ask my students sometimes, these laws that ask me to stop your car when the light is red and go ahead when it's is it, is it Islamic law or secular law? What do you think? Is it Islamic? When they tell me Islamic law, I said, well, but this nice French or nice British are the one who brought it to us. So these guys are bringing to us Islamic law. If they say it's secular law, how come it's secular law? It's saving people's lives and property. Hmm? What is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's both Islamic and secular, actually. And there are many laws that can be both Islamic and secular. Islamic law is both religious and civil law. And that is actually, actually the genius of Islam is this combination, is what uh, Ali Izzat said about you know, this realism and ideal, the idealism of the New Testament and the realism of, of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Islam never accepted splitting a human personality into temporal and spiritual. And the Islamic ideal was never the self-absorbed ascetism, but the practical ethicality. Again and again, in politics, practicality is very important. You cannot do politics without some sense of practicality. If we are practical, we can have an Islamic democracy. And this democracy will actually contribute to today's democracy. Because we have long tradition of communal right. As I said, for example, the right of minorities to use their own customs and laws within the Islamic framework. More room for ethical and legal diversity in Islamic democracy. And more integration for human life and more reconciliation between religion and the state. There are many things that Islamic democracy can contribute to today's world. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for the difficult questions. <laughs> well, I agree with uh, Islamists who want to have explicitly uh, in the Constitution, Islam as a source of law or the main source of law. Sharia. If that's, uh, yeah, as a source. yeah, Islam or Sharia. I'm using Islam and Sharia here interchangeably. Actually, that's what I believe is should be the case. Uh, but if if that is practically not possible, or again the social context is not mature, or political situation is in a risky and shaky transition, I don't mind. Uh, delay and compromise on this because pra practical there is difference big difference between uh, between uh, a, a, a political philosopher and a politician. Yeah, political philosopher doesn't have to compromise, but if you are politician, you want to do the best within the circumstances. That that's your obligation. Do the best within the circumstances. Uh, actually, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. If الاجتهاد is بذل الوسع, that's exactly what you have to do. Just do the best, work on the rest. And there is a beautiful rule on 
إن إن في الأصول إذا تعذر الواجب انتقل الخطاب إلى تحقيق وسائله إذا تعذر الواجب انتقل الخطاب الشرعي إلى تحقيق وسائله If you cannot achieve what is an obligation today that's fine but you have to start from today working on preparing yourself to be able to tomorrow so yeah I'm willing to stop doing it today because I'm not able to or it's not wise but doesn't mean that I go sleep. No, I mean I have to start preparing the ground to be able to do it uh, tomorrow. Uh, <clears throat> the right of the community or the interpretive authority of the community, yes, the best way to do it today actually is through parliaments, but both parliament and, uh, and also judges and scholars who guarantee the constitutionality of, of laws. And this is a, it's known today, you know, they have the Conseil d'État in France, the called Conseil d'État, and you have the Supreme Court in the United States, for example. You know, in, in formulating laws, you need the opinion of the common people and you need the supervision of the expert at the same time. I mean, let the parliament legislate the way, the way they want, that's fine. But there should be also a group of experts that will oversee and guarantee that this legislation doesn't violate the, the major principles, the main principles of the Constitution. Same thing can be done also for Sharia. You can let Parliament issue any kind of law they want, and you have a group of scholars, Muslim scholars and law scholars, who guarantee that any law doesn't contradict the basic tenets of Islam, and, and that should be clear in the Constitution itself. So there, there are a lot of mechanisms that we have today, and all what we need is to adopt this kind of techniques. Now, I, don't, I cannot say adopt because Dr. Tarak will be upset with me, but I will say adopt. So. <laughs> Uh, how can we evaluate the performance of Islamic, you know, organization? And I really uh, have no idea on that. Is it possible to have an Islamic state with the globalization context? Yes, we can. We can have it, but we'll do our best again. Globalization is not qadar uh, maqdura. We should not be determinist on talking about globalization. If you are, if you are effective component of the global system, you will have your world. You know, I, I was I was discussing with some brothers in Istanbul uh, uh, two months ago on this, and they said one of them was saying, "Okay, it's, uh, international law is a myth. It's something that European countries did for themselves." I told them, "Look, look, my friend. But what about China? China was not there when the international law was started, and Russia was not there, and India was not there. But these countries." became a part of it later because of their own uh, performance and power. So all what you need in this uh, context of globalization is to be a powerful player in this global system. Then you will have the ability to add your contribution and your input, whether for the international law or uh, international economy or anything. Else. As for the covenant of people of Sina, what I remember that this document is not historically authentic. And it's, al there is, it's almost evident, especially when we talk about, when the document talks about, you know, Khulid al Rashidin as witnesses. Some of them ne never, or probably all of them, never have been there in, in Sina in the first place. So uh, it's not historically. Authentic. What is historically authentic is the covenant of Prophet with people of Najran, the Christians of Najran, and it's very known. Uh, part of it is mentioned in uh, Bukhari. The text of it is in uh, in Tabaqat uh, ibn Sa'd, and you can find the text of it in the collection of documents that Dr. Hamidullah has in his book, Al Wadaiq al Siyasiya, Al Asr al Nabawi, Wal Khilafat al Rashida the political documents of the uh, prophetic and Rashidin state, or I think in French it's called La Diplomacy the Prophet. Uh, Allahu Alam. Uh, 
for the sister asking about the concept of Sharia, first, welcome home. Uh, um, anyone who converts to Islam, I, I like to say, welcome home. So, welcome home. Uh, the concept of Sharia is, is not clear, of course, it's not clear today. Because some people are reducing it to the low aspects. Uh, sometimes uh, is people see it perceived only through the lenses of coercion. There are many aspects of Islamic law that need shtihad, creative shtihad, really creative. In this, in this one, I really believe in really creative shtihad, you know. Especially in hudud, punishment. Because I really believe as a student of history of religion that, that Islam come to answer temporary questions and to set the ground for permanent questions or permanent solution. I mean, there is the, the, the big challenge in any renewal in any religious culture is the separation between what is historical and what is eternal, or what is temporary and what is permanent. So Islamic revelation comes to, to answer specific question within the concept, within the context of time and space in Arabia at that time. And to have also foundation, moral and legal foundation for all humanity in the future. So we need to separate this from, from that. Uh, there are a lot of confusion about hudud. Uh, part of it is, uh, in my personal opinion, is not grounded on solid ground in revelation itself. I don't believe that stoning, for example, has any foundation in Quran or Sunnah. And I don't believe that, you know, killing for apostasy has any foundation in Quran or Sunnah. Uh, there are others, other punishment, including corporal punishment, that are explicit in Quran and Sunnah. But we, you still have, there are a lot of room in Ishtihad on this. For example, in Hanavi school of thought, instead of cutting the hand of a thief, there is possibility of Fine, a financial a fine, for example. Yeah. Taghrim. Badal al qata And Ibn al-Arabi talk about this in his uh, Tafsir Ahkam al-Quran and the Hanavi opinion on that. So there is a room for Ishtihad actually, and there is a rich Islamic legacy on this. And you don't have also to bind by the interpretation of scholar in the past. I don't believe that a scholar of today or a scholar of the past, none of them has the authority to to over the other, I think the revelation is for all. It's for today, for f tomorrow, for past, and ishtihad will be open, should be open forever. Wallahu a'lam. As, as for uh, Sheikh uh, Abu Zuhra and his, uh, uh, yeah, that's very interesting story that I mentioned when Dr. Tarek many years ago uh, issued his uh, call about uh, about hudud and islam online asked me to comment among others on this the first uh, thing i said in my comment i mentioned the story of abu zuhra and the the lack of moral courage unfortunately among muslim scholars today that many of them don't really say what they believe because they got scared of the public. I'm not saying scared of the political authority, but even scared by the public sometimes, or scared by other, from other scholars, the same way that Sheikh Abu Zahra kept his opinion for 20 years. He was not scared of political authority. He was scared of the scholars themselves who might accuse him in his own religion or sincerity of religion. So all of this just telling us that there is much need for moral courage today and for scholars to say what they believe. Scholars are not politicians. They are not running for election. I, I mean, I hope they are not running for election. They, they should not care about public opinion or anything else. They should say what they believe. That is uh, the truth that has been revealed by Allah Azza wa uh, Political education is very important, but there are two kinds of education, abstract and Concrete, I think uh, highly educated people like you can be educated through abstract ideas. But for 
much of the common people, the real education is learning through doing. And in political education specifically, people need to be given chance to practice and to make mistakes. So if you go to an election five times, then you will know how to respect others in the line and how to, uh, to talk uh, without, you know, okay. yeah, without shouting with a different person from the other political party, etc. These need some practical training. Unfortunately, dictators are not giving us the opportunity to learn. And that is really a problem. So if a dictator falls down uh, suddenly in a revolution, people get confused and there are a lot of disturbance because they, they didn't have time to learn. Uh, so we need political education, but I believe in learning through doing in political education uh, specifically. <clears throat> Laws for people who don't, uh, who are not affiliated with any kind of religion. Well, laws are made for groups, not for individuals in the first place. When you have 20% of people of the population atheist, then, uh, and they, they feel a common identity, which I don't believe they will. They feel that they have a common identity and common values and the specific way to regulate their life, then they can ask after that to be given some uh, community right. But uh, I don't think that's usually what happened for atheists. Might happen for followers of other religious tradition, but it's hardly will happen with atheists. The, uh, the position of Islamic State within the global system uh, well, Islamic State, it's just, it's just a normal state that is reflecting the value system of its people like any other free society. Any free state will automatically reflect the value system of its society. So Islamic State is just a free state that is reflecting the value of society. It's not a state, it's not some aliens who came from another planet and they want to build something strange that has nothing in common with the rest of humanity. No, these are just the human beings who have the same aspirations, problems, shortcomings, weaknesses of other human societies and there is much, much in common. I have to emphasize that Muslims need to recognize that they have much, much in common with others and that now Muslims need to recognize that Muslims are simple human beings who have much, much in common with them. We can have difference theologically, but theological difference doesn't have to be translated into uh, practical differences. I mean, we can have difference theologically and agree on practicality, on many, many things. Uh, so as for jizya, jizya is not an obligation on Islamic State. It's not an obligation. Jizya it was the right of the state to, for their citizen who don't want to fight and they don't feel comfortable to fight in the name of the Islamic State because empires fighting in the name of religion, you know, a Copt Christian or Christian or Syrian Christian, he doesn't feel comfortable fighting, uh, you know, Byzantium, for example, or that's fine. It's actually, actually, it's a win-win solution. He doesn't have to fight people of his faith who are fighting Muslims, but he has also to contribute to the society. Muslims are giving their blood, so why, why shouldn't he or she give one dinar a year, you know, a very small and symbolic amount for that. Just like, like some, uh, some countries today who have this draft, Tejnit, called the draft, you know, that everybody has to, to have some kind of military service or to pay an amount instead of that. I think it's just the same. But this is a, a good example of that you don't have to have uniformity in Islamic State. Uh, you can create justice without creating equality. I mean, equity is not synonymous with equality. Christians were paying money that Muslims were not paying, but Muslims were paying their blood that Christians were not paying. 
everybody was doing what he's comfortable with. Everybody is have different obligations and different rights, but both are treated fairly, and that's the most important. So I believe that equity is more important in Islam than equality. Thank you.